So let me tell you about this meeting, and uh, the purpose is to get your input on the city's priorities. And uh, in particular, this uh, very complicated topic about short-term rentals. There's a whole lot of angles to this, a whole lot of size, and uh, a lot of strong feelings. So um, that's why the Planning Commission is really trying to get, the, uh, get a gauge on how you feel about it, what our best ideas are going to be. And um, the approach to this meeting is collaborative. We're keeping it friendly, keeping it uh, respectful, <laughs> fast moving, and productive. And uh, we're targeting uh, three minutes per comment or less. Like, uh, okay. I think you'll find that the shorter the comment that somebody makes, the more effective it is. And with all the folks we have here tonight, we'll, we're going to try to do that. And um, the last thing is this meeting is being broadcast on Zoom right now live. Hello, Zoom attendees. And uh, it will also be uh, recorded for a replay. So if you want to revisit it or uh, share it with your friends or whatever, that's what we'll do. All right. Can, uh, this may be challenging. Can we go around real fast and just introduce yourself? If everybody would just stand up and say your name real fast. You know, we're a friendly community. Come on, let's do it. We're friendly. Standing up. Saying right, Excellent. Rich Glavity. 
Troy Laverty. Great. Jeff James. Yeah. Louise Finkelstein. Miranda Miller. Roger Tolstorf. Gail Tolstorf. Andrew Bowman. Kevin Byer. Kevin Bradley. <laughs> Woody Warcott. Jane Everly. Margo Heels. Reed Everly. Rick Tarczynski. Juan Tarczynski. Mike Barnes. Susan Barnes. Megan Barnes. Kevin <laughs> Couple. Pat Gibbons. Dave Comer. Chris Davis. Laura Creed. Eddie Davis. Tim Martin. Eddie Davis. Oh, the boss. Rachel Marker, Sonny Love You Cannon, Shannon Bruce, Alan Carlisle, Debbie Ashenbrenner, Bill Ashenbrenner, David Everett, Kathy Kellahar, Artis Conley, Jim Conley, Dan Mulder, Nancy Rondell, Let's do the silence. Uh, Jeff Grimm, Linda Rockwitz, Brad Rockwitz. Bill Harmon. Catherine Nielsen, formerly Trumbull. Good job getting in there. That's what we're looking at. Good. Is that it? No. 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 Macro. Uh, James Cassidy. Carol Winter. Sue Holmes. Lisa Nickel. <laughs> Becky Beckett. Because you don't have so much. Carol Kijak. Tom Kijak. Jim Moffat, John Foley, yeah, we can't be. David LaMarche, Bill Fulmer, Sandy Fulmer, Sissy Springgate, Kyle Knight, Craig Corrigal. All right, good job. Where's David? All right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, he's the man. That was to emphasize that uh, we're all a community, we're all neighbors, we're all friends. And uh, even though this can be a divisive issue, it's a confusing issue, we're all in it together. And uh, we're all just looking for the best solutions for the uh, for our community, right? And Bill, I just want to make, mention that there are several people on Zoom as well. So, oh. so we got probably about eight or so. All right. You don't you have to go through their names. Like like I don't know. Matt Wehrman. Mr. Wehrman. Bonnie. Oh, hello, Bonnie. Yeah. And a few more. Okay, welcome Zoom attendees. All right, here's the outline for the meeting. Uh, we've uh, already just covered the first one. We're going to do a quick introduction on the topic for five minutes, and uh, a little bit of background. Then we're going to talk about 45 minutes, and we're going to wrap it up. So uh, it's going to be fast moving, fun, and informative. Ready? Let's go. Okay, so the uh, planning commission would like your input on these three macro questions. One is, what's your own experience with short-term rentals, both as a uh, neighbor, a renter, could be an owner, uh, or any other uh, any other relationship that you have? And then, what's the what do you see the impact of short-term rentals on our community? And then, should there be guidelines, rules, and restrictions? All right, those are three overarching questions we're going to ask for your assistance with. All right, let's go. Um, Andrew Bowman is here, and he's going to tell us about the Planning Commission because it's so fascinating. Right. <laughs> Most exciting stuff in town. Um, Planning Commission, everybody knows mostly what they do. I won't bore you with that. It's basically we are appointed, not elected. We're appointed by the mayor and city council. You serve for a two year term. Um, our job is to review site plan applications and also to develop the master plan. Those are the two primary things we do. Uh, we make recommendation to council for changes to the zoning code. Um, so that's basically the responsibility. Um, Bill put together a better bullet point than I just said, but that's basically what the planning commission does. So we, um, we do act on site plan approvals. Um, those are decided at planning commission. Changes to the zoning code are uh, recommended and developed by the planning commission and ultimately approved by city council. So that's basically the... Uh, Planning Commission, if you will, to the next. So uh, the master plan is what we're working on right now. That's obviously, it's a re review process every five years. Um, 
Bill really was the driving force behind having these public forums. Obviously, in the last year and a half, it's been difficult to get public input. Uh, there were surveys done online on any, any number of topics in the, under the master plan, not just short-term rentals. This obviously is a key element because it, uh, it both influences the character of the town, also influences uh, businesses downtown, and it also influences the uh, housing inventory for long-term rental or year-round rental. So um, it, the master plan is not law. It is not the, the rules of the road. It is a visionary. It's, it's aspirational. And that is the document that you refer back to looking at, at when you're developing your zoning code or deciding to make any changes. So um, that's the next slide, please. So short-term rental background. Um, basically, everybody knows the, the major statistics on Harbor Springs. So I won't bore you with those. Um, what we've seen, short-term rentals have been part of Harbor Springs you know, almost as long as Harbor Springs has been here. It's probably the number of short-term rentals and the method by which they're rented that's changed the most. Um, the original zoning code, to the best of my knowledge, the only thing it said about short-term rentals, this is about three or four years ago when we changed this, it was only said less than one week, less than seven days was not permitted, but it gave no provisions for regulating gave no licensing process. It gave no rules of enforcement to the city. Um, so that was just a leftover from when the code was first adopted, probably in 1976 or thereabouts. Um, so really at the behest of city staff about three or four years ago, uh, Jeff was starting to see more uh, pressure on some areas with short-term rentals. He recommended that we go through the zoning code and develop a licensing program. He went to a few uh, conferences. I think maybe Michigan State Extension was one of them and came back with sort of, I don't know if there are best practices for short-term rentals, but a reasoned approach to try to manage these. And the basics, uh, there are packets available that give you an example of what the license is, what the requirements are as far as um, a, a registering your property if someone's going to be a short-term rental. Um, and the uh, big problem with the original seven-day minimum is it where there was no way to decide or have, there was no, uh, enforcement that was possible uh, with that old rule. So this new, by licensing people, the city at least has an inventory, they have a phone number of who's responsible for the property. And it was probably a first step in what will be, hopefully unless state of Michigan changes some things, the ability to, to manage short-term rentals uh, more effectively. So next slide. Well, there's one thing I'd like to point out on that one is, uh, um, yeah. regardless of short-term rental, only 37% of our housing units in the city, our primary residents. So 63% are something And else. that would be determined by a registered voter, correct? Um, no, it would be the uh, or principal residence exemption. Residence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that, <laughs> so there's, you know, like other resort communities, you know, we have some dark houses in the winter. And uh, <laughs> yeah, some of them. <laughs> a lot of them. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. And I think the next slide gets me off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all right. So here, uh, just to set the stage, here's our city, city of Harvest Springs, current approach to short-term rentals. Uh, we say that you have to get an annual license and that costs $250. We don't have a limit on the number of licenses that we grant or the uh, limit on you know, where uh, short-term rentals can be located. You have to have a local agent, we call it, uh, with contact information posted on the door. That person has to be able to get there and address any issues within one hour. And then the city has contact information on file for that agent as well. It could be you as the owner, or it could be somebody that you hired as your agent. Um, you have to make a summary of key city ordinances available to the renters so that everybody knows. And uh, the enforcement resources that the city has include uh, various city staff members. We, uh, we, the city, have hired a network scanning service that uh, scans all the rental websites and uh, deduces whether a property is uh, located in the city of Harbor Springs. And then Jeff and team can uh, reference that and find out if somebody's operating in an unlicensed way. And you saw that there are, I think it was 51 licenses are out there today in 2021. And there are an additional 30 some that this company has told us we, they think are operating in the city unlicensed. So that's, um, that's the method that the city uses to try to track down people that um, aren't legal. And uh, then uh, the police get involved too for uh, behavioral type uh, complaints about a particular rental and anything else. So, all right. And uh, just to set the stage some more, uh, cities worldwide are 
wrestling with this thing. And it is um, uh, probably most uh, painful in resort communities. And, you know, we're right in the epicenter of you know, Resortville. So we're feeling it. But the Colorado mountain towns have been fighting this and fighting about this for decades now. And they're, they've come up with various solutions. And um, uh, even in Europe and around the world, um, where I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to visit a few foreign capitals and um, uh, people we talked with said, yeah, I used to live downtown here in Lisbon. But I had to so I had to rent it, and I had to move out to the suburbs just because the money was so good, and uh, it's hollowed out our town. Amsterdam, I know, is just beside themselves. They're furious. It's just turned into a full-time, uh, you know, revolving door hotel situation. So they're they're really upset. So it's not just Harbor Springs, believe me. It's it's all around the world that uh, we're wrestling with these same issues. Okay, and. Uh, so here is something uh, that underlies everything that we're going to talk about tonight. In both the Michigan House and the Senate, there's legislation pending um, that would have uh, that would uh, forbid cities or townships or any municipality from regulating short-term rentals through the zoning um, code or zoning ordinances. And um, they they have exactly the same wording, and they have numerous sponsors and uh, quite a lot of support. And uh, if these were enacted, then uh, we and other municipalities would have no ability to regulate short-term rentals uh, with special rules. The, the rules would have to apply to all 12 units, and I'll take you through the, the wording. And uh, if this were to pass and become law, then that would negate some of the approaches that we might talk about tonight, or we might come up with our best creative thinking and best approach. So uh, this whole discussion could be academic, and we may not ever have the ability to um, regulate short-term rentals based on zoning. So let me take you through here. Oh, here are the sponsors. And uh, in the Senate bill, it also includes our state senator, uh, Senator Schmidt was a sponsor of this bill. Okay, next slide, please. So here's, here's the wording. Let me just uh, take you to the key point, points. Um, so for the purposes of zoning, all the following apply to the rental of a dwelling, including uh, short-term rental. And so it says it's a residential use of property and a permitted use in all residential zones. So uh, this is wording that uh, hits right at the heart of a potential argument to call this a commercial enterprise. They say, this law would say it is not a commercial enterprise and it can't be considered that. And uh, cities and townships cannot make it subject to a special land use or conditional permit. And uh, it's not a commercial use of property. So you have to treat short-term rental properties exactly the same as you treat all rental pro or all properties in your zoning district. So uh, we may come up with a ton of great ideas tonight, but uh, that may be totally uh, negated. <clears throat> so next slide, please. But... Uh, the section does not prohibit regulation on a consistent basis uh, for noise, advertising, traffic, and other conditions for the prevention of nuisances. So blight, you know, uh, a number of people that may occupy a dwelling, uh, inspections and inspection fees, and uh, all taxes. So um, those are the only angles that a uh, municipality would be able to regulate anybody, any dwelling in its area. So, um, you still willing to talk about ideas, even with this overhanging us? We know it may, it may come to not. Bill, do we know the timing? No, there's, you know, it's always a negotiation about when to bring a bill to the floor in each chamber, and do we have the votes, or let's delay it, or let's speed it up. And, uh, it's come out of committee, I think. A I couple times. Yeah. Parent, both have come out of committees. And then they come back into session in September. Okay. Yeah. First week, first week of September. Okay. Yeah. Another schedule. All right. So, yeah. Are there any states that have enacted bills similar to this? Uh, I've just seen headlines that there are a number of states where this is uh, also going on. But so I don't know if anybody's enacted, enacted it. been in place for some time and you can get an idea of what's. I, what's I don't going. know of that. I don't know. Uh, the question was I think, yeah, are any states. Do any states have this in force right now where we can get some information or learn something about it? And I don't know of that. I don't know that answer, but I 
also do know that the Supreme Court has not tackled this issue. So if the state doesn't act, the bill would likely get challenged to the federal courts and find its way into the Supreme Court. So I don't, really, I don't think there has been any notable one yet. So that would push it years down the road, even if it were passed quickly within 2021. If Pixar's right, that's years way down the road. And in the interim, sounds like we have decisions to make you know, and lifestyles to choose. My understanding is a, a newly passed law can take effect very quickly. And if it's challenged, is if it's challenged. If it's challenged, it doesn't mean it's revoked. Right. No, but it's still challenged. Still challenged. It could take forever. It, it could take forever. Yeah. But you can continue to operate under the auspices of that law being fact mm -hmm. until it's stricken in the court of law. Well, no, yeah. all it takes is the first court. Right. So if the first court strikes it down, then it cannot be enforced until it goes all the way through the Supreme Court. So it doesn't necessarily take years. And the other options um, for regulation that you outlined look really strong, powerful, and useful to me. I'm sorry. The other options for managing, regulating um, short-term rentals that you outlined, yes. even regardless of the bill, yes. they look powerful, they look clear, they look enforceable, and they seem to me to be good for a neighborhood. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, here is uh, Senator Schmidt, our uh, state senator. Here's his contact information. And um, you think it would be helpful if anybody has some feelings that you'd contact his office and let him know where you stand on this. And uh, since he's one of the sponsors of the bill, there's his contact information. It's super easy to find on the state Senate website. So don't be shy if you have feelings, get in touch with him. And here's our state representative, John Moose. Um, John is uh, not in favor of this. John has expressed his uh, opposition to the bill and is looking to modify and improve it. And he definitely understands the feelings of the resort communities in his district. And uh, so he's working to uh, get a better deal. So there's his contact information. You'd be welcome to contact him as well. And of course, the governor, you know, let's not forget the governor. She should know too. Yes, Raul. You intend to talk about how it might affect parking, for example, parking. We can talk about many things. Sure. So let's save that for uh, the next section. Thank you. All right. So here we go. Question one. I thought maybe it would be helpful if we could just share some of our own experiences with short-term rentals and uh, just keep it brief. But you know, let us know what you're seeing, feeling, thinking, and. Um, then we'll get on to the next one. Yes, I make a suggestion. We open it up to the in-house people first, then go to Zoom. Great. Let's do that. In-house. Jeff. My concern is, and I'd like to go to number three, which was kind of rules and regulations. Yeah. What I'm seeing a lot of, which is creating a lot of problems with parking for that matter, is one family is allegedly leasing some place for a short-term rental. However, they are bringing four and five families. That seems like it'd be pretty easy to uh, uh, to police and things like that. And we were talking with the uh, post person the other day. She said the number of beds, uh, blow up beds, and these things that you order, you pull them out of a box, you cut it, and then it blows up ten times. You would not believe how many of those things that people are shipping up here. <laughs> Which to me says a lot. Yeah. But it's it's creating, you know, four or five cars in front of a house. It's uh, and I've seen this more than once, you know, three or four couples and then ten kids. Yeah. And so, you know, if it's a single family dwelling, yeah, maybe you can have two families. I understand that. But to have four and five families is creating the problem. And this uh, happened, I uh, remember years ago when the, uh, uh, before Pearson's, and that guy brought all his people up from Grand Ra from uh, yeah. Traverse City, and they had 14 people living in that house. That's the problem. Okay, so that is a problem. So that's your experiences, overcrowding, parking. Um, all right, what, what else have people experienced? Trash, trash, yeah. fires. fires. My name is Troy Lavity, and I, had resort rental management for 10 years. And unfortunately for us, I never had that experience. And I think the key thing to this is whoever is managing the property, yes. that they take, this is what we did. You take the name of every, you require the name of everybody that's gonna be involved in that. 
you take critical information now, whether it's car information or whatever it is, you make them sign a contract. And if they, they abuse that contract, they don't get their deposit back. It's amazing how this impacts people. You hold them accountable. But who's ever responsible, whether it be the property manager, whomever it is, they part of their job is to check on those homes. I mean, I have taken my husband out to some of the properties and said, we're going out and we're going to check on this. And if there were supposed to be 10 people in the house and there was 12 or 14, we threw them out. And you need to have a very strict and consistent process by which you manage this. I agree with the people that they're their neighbors and this happens to them. That should never happen. But it's up to the property manager to make sure that the guidelines are addressed and kept. If you see, I mean, what time, you know, we had to go out to a property and there were supposed to be eight people in it and there was 10 cars. Well, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out <laughs> there's a property here or there's a problem. And so we went in and knocked at the door. We saw several more people who said, you've got one hour to get out of here. If we're going to sit here and county people that leave, there better not be any damage to that property. And you only have to do that a couple times. And your reputation precedes you. And they know you better not screw with it. And pardon my language, I'm sorry. But I think it's really a truth for whoever is responsible for that property that they don't encroach, they don't encroach on the neighbors or whatever um, community they might be in. And I think that's the shortcoming. We have people who don't monitor it. Yep. Good, um, excellent. Thank you. I have your phone number. <laughs> 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 and that's, that's a good point too but unfortunately a lot of the people that have bought the homes here live out of state and they're running their oh everybody with, everybody i have was out of state yeah. Yeah. but the but you know, I get, what i'm saying is these are people that i know they don't live here and they're running their homes sure. they're in another oh, and that's they're not problem. there Okay, come on, say it a point. Okay, I, a point yeah, I, time, okay, okay, I, I would like to say I have had a lot of people contacting me lately because we do live right downtown and we're a newer home downtown. And people are asking me who live downtown, what are your experiences just even up to today? And I can tell you, every single person said we're locking our doors at night. We've never done that anymore. We now have to lock our doors. We are not leaving our garage doors open. We are not leaving keys right. at our cars anymore. Um, I had 10 people on bicycles. Our, our driveway is not on the street. It's hard to get to it. I had 10 bicyclists. I, four were already off of them, approaching our gate which is way off, going around our house, wanted to know if we rent our house. They're, they are on private property. Okay. So that is starting to happen, but the unsafety thing. And then um, I know there's several people here. We've had many things go on, as Jeff said, just the numerous amount of people. And, but at uh, 2.40 on um, this Sunday morning, mm -hmm. and all of our living and behind our house, we have outdoor living. These houses have been going until three o'clock in the morning awesome. and they're drinking well they're here for a week so they're here to party it's a vacation and i get that but they're fighting they're yelling it's going on until three in the morning loud music and at 2 40 this past sunday morning we had the delight of a fireworks show this is not your run-of-the-mill walmart um thing. this is a pull-up permit pyrotechnics that went on for 20 minutes it was in our backyard, Downtown. which is full, right at the very end. It was right at um, Glen Drive, where Dalwood is. That is, it's drier than a bone down there. And we could read a book. Our house lit up, and it was a VRBO. Wait, excuse me, is that where the fireworks were? Or yes, that's where, that's where they were. Did you call that? That's our yard. Oh. It was, are we but, sure that's where they were? Yeah. No, actually, I do know where they were, and I can't remember the address, but it was it's a VRBO, and it's behind, uh, I can't remember their name, but anyway, it was about halfway down. All right, so those are a couple of not very good experiences. Well, no, our whole, I will say, second, third street, that yeah. whole area down there, everybody who lives down there has said, I just had somebody tell me today, they have up on the bluff that they are a week-to-week -week renter. They, the house next door keeps 
flipping. They've had people who smoke outside all night long. So when their windows are open and then the charming one was the man who didn't want to wake up his family at night. So he would urinate outside underneath the window. So, and that's on the bluff. So this is happening all over. These people are, it's how do you control that? How do you police that? How do you, uh, who's the property manager? Okay, ma'am. The comment about not having a local manager, but that's the point of having a local agent and having that piece of paper on the door. That's right. Not that you want to at 2.40 in the morning, go to that house and look up that number and call the homeowner. But that's what needs to happen. These homeowners have to be contacted immediately and let them know there's a problem. And that's the whole point of paying the 250 to have the agent's name on the door. Okay, or sir. we have to call the police to come. In our come community, if you call the homeowner, they don't answer their phone. Call the police. Why should they we just, have to call the homeowner? Okay, let's not jump to solutions yet. We're still sketching some information soon. In an ideal world, and the, the manager thing makes a lot of sense, but managers don't answer to anyone. Yeah. Oh, I did. I had one hour. To well, you're okay. Well, the one in the house by yeah. us, the manager is the handyman who mows the lawn, and she's in Europe while all the problems are going on. Right. Okay. We don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I live next door to a short-term rental, and her fireworks were next to me. It was a wedding party. So there were five or six bridesmaids there, and they were fairly quiet this time, but usually there's a lot of noise around at 2 o'clock in the morning. They have a fire pit. They had a big fire. They left it going and left the building. Um, they don't have a posting on their door with who the contact information is. I reported it to Jeff and uh, other city staff members. And they still don't have still it, so there's no way to contact them. And so we just, they need some kind of enforcement on these people. They're, they live out of state. They, I don't lock, I lock my doors now. I, I, I just don't know who's living next to me. All right, Phil, did you have, yeah, uh, Phil Harmon. Uh, most of my feelings uh, were addressed in a prior city hall meeting and published in the paper. And, uh, I'm surrounded uh, by short-term rentals. One to my left, two houses across the street, two houses behind me, and two houses to my right. Um, all of my neighbors um, feel the same way as I do, um, which <clears throat> something needs to be done about this. And I'd just like to read real quick. I have three minutes. Just a little bit of a letter that one of them gave to me. Um, I'm sure you've become aware the turnover of transits in our neighborhoods has changed our lifestyles. Should I lock my house when I leave now? Why are all those cars parked in front of my house? When I call out and say hello to folks in the yard next to me, there's no response. They must be renters. Uh, these are not strong arguments against short-term rentals, but they're an erosion of our former quality of life, which is one of my main points. Our new neighbor owners deliberately hide the fact that they intend to become Airbnb operators. My neighbor did. This upsurge is in dire need of a regulation before Harbor Springs gets hollowed out into a town occupied by a high percentage of revolving strangers. The transformation within our neighborhoods is happening so fast. Logically, there are many longtime residents who are reluctant to make ourselves known publicly on this issue. We have dear friends, such as many realtors in town, whose businesses are thriving because of this trend. And we hope that our city council members will find a compromise that establishes regulations to protect our neighborhoods while promoting understanding and retaining goodwill between the business community and those of us who view the situation as already out of hand. We implore you to address this problem quickly. That's why we're here. Thank you, sir. Let's get both sides. Sir, I have a question. What is the minimum rental period in the city? Well, Jeff Graham, I'm the zoning administrator. Currently, we do not have a minimum. One of the things that we found in researching this was trying to require a minimum is very difficult to enforce, if not impossible. Um, previously, when we had our seven night minimum stay, what we would find is people would create their listing, rent the property for seven days, but then the property owner would only stay there for three. Technically, they're in compliance, but how do you enforce that? 
it's very difficult. Ask your question again. Does anybody have a good experience? Does anybody have a good experience? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Alan Carlisle. I own a house on Main Street that I do. We, we do rent things sort of between staying ourselves and and we rent. We're pretty strict in our guidelines with our with our renters about we say is acceptable and what what our expectations are. We do have a, a local agent. Um, I as a well, I guess. What, I've been called a resort, which I think is some. Well, I've been told a step above fudgy. That's a compliment. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I've, been, I've been a resort for about thirty years or so. But um, I think this community has always struggled with, you know, the the tensions of the fudgies and you know the the commerce that they bring and then the the headaches that they bring. My concern is, I think um, some regulations, some rules are definitely important, but um, if you know, I wonder how many, I, I would doubt that if you took a percentage of the people that were lighting fireworks at two o'clock on a Sunday morning, it's probably pretty small. Obviously, that's completely unacceptable, but I do think the community is pretty dependent upon the commerce that comes with all of the tourism as well. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, excuse me, I'm Dave Comer. We have a rental. Um, it's a garage apartment right next to our house. And we have very strict rules as to no smoking on the property, period. Um, during the, the, the season, it's a minimum of seven nights. <clears throat> After Labor Day, we do two night minimum. And we've had no problems, period. Probably because we're right there and we're counting heads as they go in the door. But that's the bottom line is it is the absentee people who, who, who just figure out for the buck okay mm -hmm. they're not here and they buy up the, the quote, affordable stuff that yeah. needs a lot of help mm -hmm. fix it up a little bit and boom it's an airbnb or a BRB. <laughs> who here has been a renter short-term renter on vacation or something like that a lot of us interesting and how was that experience <laughs> great because we're all good runners right yeah. i mean we're not yeah, yeah. It's been delightful when I've done it. I have a quick question. I don't know if it's just pie in the sky, but it, until this bill would pass or whatever, are there any freedoms for a community that in the meantime, you can set your own restrictions? For instance, let the VRBOs that are running here and successfully, mm -hmm. as we say, we have a high amount, but put a moratorium on it. Grandfather them and say, we're done. No more. And if you can't afford to live here, a lot of these people can't afford to buy the houses in Harbor. That's why they're renting it. They want the property, but they have to rent it to afford it. So you're kind of out of luck. Either you can afford to buy the house and it sits empty or you come to it, but stop only in a in an area, stop saturating the entire downtown with I hear these you. people I hear changing. You. These are solutions. So we're laying the groundwork and we're going to jump to solutions pretty soon. Does anybody else have an experience? I just, I've been a, I own a condo on Bay Street. I've owned it for 35 years, rented it out. At the beginning, um, I rented to dogs. We were allowed uh, two dogs. I thought I was being very nice. I felt sympathy for my renters. I had a lot of people coming for decades. I fielded a lot of complaints from my neighbors because of all that, the dogs mostly. But I, like I said, I felt loyal to my renters. The neighbors changed and things got stricter and stricter. Um, finally, we're putting fines on homeowner condo owners for dogs and cars and things like that. And so I changed my rules. Ultimately, it became a lot easier on me. I didn't have the complaints. Everybody was happier. So any property owners here who are concerned about having too many regulations on them, you're still going to get as many renters. I lost my dog people, but I, I found other people, great people. Um, and it's so much easier to say, I'm sorry, it's the association rules. So I think in the city, it's going to be so much easier to say, I'm sorry, these are the city rules. No campfires, limited cars. I did want to bring up the city of Palm Springs, California has a great uh, uh, website. The rules are very strict on renters, noise, things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a great model to look at for us. Mm -hmm. A lot of similarities between the towns. But ultimately, the more rules there are, the happier people are going to be. 
and the income will still be the same for the property. Very interesting. Oh, I do believe that one thing has to be recognized before you move. Okay. <clears throat> the question was asked, did anybody have a positive uh, experience associated with our rental, short-term rental, or the resorters? We happen to be resorters of about 19 years in this town. When the economy crashed in 08, we had the pleasure of owning two houses, one that was for sale, one we bought. And we were able to keep that house, the second one, from hitting foreclosure and going to be a problem for the community and property values by taking advantage of some short term. It was really trading dollars. We weren't getting rich. But the biggest thing that everybody in this room that owns property in this town has enjoyed, every one of us, is the fact that 63% of the houses are paying big boy taxes for not living here. And that helps everybody. It helps the 37% that live year round. And it also helps those who don't because the city can afford the better services. So everything comes with a cost. Good. Thank you for your point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I know uh, we rented in Good Heart one year. It was fine. And they manage it very closely up there. And, they're, you know, Carolyn does it. And everything's great. But what I've noticed in this community, and I've lived on Little Traverse Bay my entire life, Harbor Springs, almost 40 years. Um, it's my mother's house, but the family uses it at a, as a whole. We have a lot of friends in this community who are in associations, ourselves being one. Ours is a, a little toothless, it's kind of loose. There are others that are very tight and they have rules about rentals, including um, you know, a month to month, no shorter than a month. The boards must approve renters. So you have sponsorship, et cetera, et cetera. So using the association rather like a rental company that the woman was talking about. We know people that are renters and we know families that rent and everybody has a good experience, but it goes back to this point of rules, regulations and enforcing them. Is there a concern that the legislation could remove those abilities um, from associations and oh. cities and townships? Uh, so that's a good question. The question was, if an association has stricter rules about anything, you know, can it, um, you know, would this law, if it became law, um, you know, uh, hinder associations? And uh, I don't know that I can say Answers, definitively yeah. on that. I think associations have stricter. Yeah, you know, like a homeowners association can have all kinds of you know, rules and regulations that aren't even contemplated by a city's zoning code. So, you know, with this new state law, would that still be we, maintained? I think so, right? Yes. I think yeah. so. Association is a voluntary, you voluntarily agree to the bylaws of that association. Mm -hmm. So that's why. They're not as state. legally binding as what a and municipality might Most be. Most of them are. Yeah. 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 They can foreclose on you if you don't be your disposal. Well, yeah. yes, correct. But again, it goes back to bylaws. You've got to have okay. some pretty One more comment bylaws. on this question. As I course. read that legislation from both the House bill yeah. and yeah. the Senate bill, the restriction would be for the local governmental entity not to be able to limit the but, but then all the other stuff which is control of, of behavior behaviors that's that's <clears throat> not limited that's, and it would have to be the same as it um, would be enforced the same way on you know full-time residents every kind of resident there right is. David. yeah the, the bills say two things that you can do you can limit the number of people in the house for instance yeah. that we should be doing that you can uh, also all other rules apply, as you just said, with regard to nuisance, and it does not is not an exemption from the zoning laws. So all the zoning laws still apply. So okay, let's can, move on. Uh, bill, I'll just clarify that that bill there that you can limit the amount of people that occupy the house, but no differently than you limit the amount of people outside. Right. It doesn't say that. Yeah, it does not say that. It says specifically that you can limit the number of people in a house, but, but the same way it says that. in a different it's section that you can't enforce, for instance, licensing. You can't have a license unless you require a license for owner. So that would, what we have right now would go away, but it does not limit uh, some of the other things that you can do. And what I've said before is we shouldn't worry about the difficulty of enforcement 
and avoid good rules. Right. We're going to talk exactly about that. I think we've got to move on, Barry. Let's move to the next slide, please, and we'll come back to you. Bill, you don't get up to the Zoom. What's that? Anyone on Zoom? Oh. Yeah. Uh, anyone on Zoom or did we pretty much cover it here? <laughs> no. I'm not All right. I, I have a quick con comment about, about the enforcement. It takes money. Who came up with two hundred fifty dollars? Okay, you we're going to talk about that. Very, around, we're going to talk about solutions. I swear. Dollars in other cities. Okay. Let's, okay. So here are the complaints that I've heard, and uh, you covered them all. So. <laughs> okay. So help me. I, I appreciate if you help me think this through. So your neighbors could be any of these. It could be a short-term rental property. It could be a seasonal rental property, right? Somebody who rents for the whole summer. Could be a long-term rental, so somebody who lives there for the whole year. You're right. Could be an owner-occupied uh, situation where they just use it on weekends <coughs> and holidays. Could be owner-occupied uh, seasonal residents or resorters. Could be owner-occupied full-time residents. And it could be vacant, vacant or unused. So what is it about short-term rentals that is so heinous that we ought to have special regulations? Basically, like, lack of control. Mm -hmm. Basically, lack of control. Dangerous behavior. Dangerous behavior. You do not know who is your neighbor. Don't know who your, who's your neighbor. Right. From some, day to day. Right. <laughs> if somebody is there for long term for a year, they yeah. either a, have the money to be there, they're there for a reason, yeah. or they have a job and they're working. It's that's I'm saying year being the longest, but short a month or so. There's consistency. Mm -hmm. and it's people who come in town for a short term vacation. Yes. And they go crazy every night. Mm -hmm. and okay make okay. noise and do things in a neighborhood where you live and work and have to get up at eight in the morning and be somewhere and show up. Okay. It's like renting a car versus owning a car. Renting a car versus owning a car. Okay, that's good. What's wrong? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. future problems with diseases. Pardon me? Well, uh, I don't need to shift the focus to me. It's unavoidable. You now learn that COVID, even though you may have survived it, a lot of your vessels in your body have not. It is a vascular disease. Okay. And the argument that you can go ahead and tough it out yourself may leave you half a person. And the children that you put into that situation, okay. they do the same. Now, I'm not a physician. But I've been reading a lot on certain things. How does that relate to short term rentals? Yeah. You're putting a whole community that's different from you, and they've come here oh. and they're there for a few days. Okay. Okay. What do okay. you want? All right. I, don't, I can choose to not go into stores where people don't yeah. do that, but I, I can't avoid them. We have vaccinated locals that are getting the virus. Sure. When I was a okay. kid, we had a banner on the house right across the door. Yellow. German measles. Got it. Okay. That's it. Okay. I get that. I get that point. Um, why don't we move on in light of our time? Thank you for helping me answer that. So I think we've also addressed this to a degree. What's the impact on the community? I've heard about uh, hollowing out of the community, changing of neighborhoods. Uh, you don't know who your neighbor is going to be on a, any given weekend or um, any, what else what else do you sense man um, i'm concerned about the fact that as people buy the buy them as investment properties they jacked up all of the prices of the homes that are on the market and consequently young families that we want to move into this community mm -hmm. or people who are mm -hmm. retired that want to move in and live here full-time can't and i think that from a long-term perspective the impact for instance on the school district mm -hmm. i bought um, the house that i live in 16 years ago and i specifically bought close to the schools mm -hmm. because i love to hear little kids running <laughs> up and down the street and there's fewer and fewer uh, um, families that can afford to live here and that's going to have i think a really detrimental long-term impact on this community because people want to live here in part because the school district's a great school district but if we don't have young families who can afford afford to move here, it's gonna it's gonna change the community. So I heard two things in 
uh, effect on real estate prices and two, um, the downstream effect on the school. And then I thought I might've heard in there like less housing available for people. Mm -hmm. That's because we are, you know, we have that issue right now with the restaurants closing a couple days a week because we don't have anybody working there because the people that we need to come in and help work to these facilities can't afford to live there. So it's, um, so it's yeah. Big yeah. Big but that ends in so, <laughs> still yeah. today. But, but also I think like if I have small children, to the point that a lot of people made here, I would be very nervous. I've got some, and I like my neighbors next year, but they do short-term rentals mm -hmm. two, three days at a time. If I had small children living in my house, that would make me very nervous. Okay. And I haven't had bad experience with their specific renters, but I would not feel comfortable. And if all of the houses in my neighborhood start doing short-term rentals, I'll move. Because yeah. that's not the community not that I bought into. Yeah. Ma'am. It uh, might be a good time for me to chime in. Uh, so I grew up in Harbor Springs. I live in D.C. now, um, but obviously I come back to visit my parents. And if I ever want to move back to Harbor Springs, it's not it's not happening. I can't afford to live here, even having a pretty good job in D.C. I mean, it, every time I come back, that sort of maybe pipe dream of moving back actually becomes further away. Uh, and it, it is due to the impact of short-term rentals in part. Uh, and then also just to add that when I come back, you know, I get that every year view, but I, I grew up here. So I, I have this connection and the place is a little different every time. It really is. I mean, I see the people that my parents interact with, people who come over and it's resorters, it's residents. And suddenly there's less and less of that happening. Mm -hmm. And so it's really obvious uh, it, to me as someone who grew up here that there has been a shift. There's been a change in, in my neighborhood. Thank you for that observation. That's very helpful. Sir, I have a, a, a comment on the tax base. We have four um, short-term rentals in our neighborhood. Two of them are never, rarely occupied by the owners, and they claim the homestead exemption. So the notion that, that they're paying big boy taxes is not always true. 50% of the ones on, that I've researched don't. So that's something that the community loses out on. So that's it. That's easily enforceable. Jeff, do you want those addresses? They got to pay. I'm county is doing confirming that you deserve the homestead advantage. Uh, our county is in my wife's trust, so we had to come back with the, the homestead application for her. And yeah. pages on the trust, so that may weed out a couple yeah, of those people that are, yeah. are, are, are abusing here. Abusing. Yeah, that's not right. Okay. So, I, you know, I hear the argument about we need it for our economic, your economy, our business, for the city. But you know, I, I know a lot of the people that stay in our neighborhood. They have small kids. They they cook. They cook. They they have a kitchen. You know, it's a house, so they can save money and they eat. They don't eat out. They go to Mackinac Island for the day. They go to Charlevoix and eat. I don't. I don't really. Th I think Charlevoix comes here. I don't really think it matters that much. We've been before Airbnbs, a thriving resort community. So I don't think we need these. Okay. So I'm a host. I'm not still here, but <laughs> I just want to say to that point that um, I haven't lived in Harvest from my whole life or anything, but. As a host, I have a whole list of things you can do in this area. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of my favorite restaurants is Small Batch. It's a mm -hmm. very expensive restaurant. I'm a single mom with two kids. And we can only go there once in a while because it's so expensive. But I always tell my guests, go there, it's totally worth every penny. My guests always email me afterwards. So thankful for that recommendation. Loved it. It was totally worth every penny. So my guests do go out to eat. I mean, people are going, they're getting cookies, they're, you know, they're doing stuff, even if they are cooking out. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, I think um, I think we got a picture on the impact on the community. I think we've heard the main points. Are, There's oh. something we really missed. Okay, and that, bring it up. Um, and then that is who is going to run the city business. If people haven't paid attention, there are two open seats on city council this yeah. year and nobody's yeah. running for them. Yeah. So there are going to be write-ins. And if you don't have enough yeah. people living here, 
to be registered voters yep. year round to run, you're going to get the same old, same old in city council or people saying, as I did after I was on the school board for seven, nine years. And I said, that's enough. It's turn for somebody else. But there's what, what are you going to do when there's nobody left to run the town? And that's great. That's, that's, like, that's like one of my great issues. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on. Bill, we should open it up to Zoom. Oh, you're right. I do have a thought to share. First, I'd like to, I was going to come in on the first question, if I may. Thank you for welcoming me from afar. I'm a Harbor Springs native, class of 89, Harbor High. Uh, would live there right now with my family if there was any way we could, but our jobs keep us away. Uh, we are, consider ourselves privileged to, uh, pay, uh, you know, non, non homesteaded property taxes and completely uh, uh, love being part of the community when we can we are not we're we don't make a living at this but we do have a rental and we it was a home that we originally originally bought right next door to our cottage for a guest house to expand uh, for our family. Uh, but over time, it, as we looked at it, it made financial sense for us to to rent it uh, when we are not there. Um, we have very strict rules. It's a very small house. We have a four person limit uh, on the property. Um, we've actually, as far as the economic impact, getting to, the, getting to this question number two, the economic impact of visitors to our town, it is, it's a, it's a, I'd just like to point out, it is a town that is founded very much on, on tourism and there's no place to stay. There aren't hotels, there aren't uh, you know, motels. Uh, to, be, to be able to provide a place for visitors to stay in town is consistent with one of the pillars of our economy. Um, I completely am, uh, I'm against the state bill. I wanna go on record saying that. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a property owner and a host, I am supportive of all the rules and regulations. We, we uh, are a licensed renter, uh, fully following all the rules of the city. Um, and, uh, but I do think that, that, you know, I think that rules and regulations on property management companies that are investors uh, limit on number of properties that folks can rent. So they're renting their private spaces and not operating it as a, as a you know, expanded motel or a business. I think, I, you know, I can't speak for other renters in the in the neighborhood but i think that uh there can be a positive effect on the community uh while uh taking care of the concerns of the community in the neighborhoods thank you for that perspective may i ask him a question sure how would you feel in the home that you live in now for your family if you were surrounded by short-term rentals and you're neighborhood where you live now here, here. and you had changes going on every week not knowing like what we've addressed and everything else yeah I, and I mean uh, totally surrounded i mean all sides behind you yeah your i can't i can't relate to being totally surrounded but i can count three or four short-term rentals in the neighborhood where we where we do have our primary residence in atlanta and uh and i yeah i i I completely agree, and I and I think that there should. That's why I do think that there is an opportunity uh, to 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 satisfy the needs of of all sides. I think that with the proper rules and regulations uh, and fees um, and the type of people that we do, we attract as a community, I think that we can. Uh, you know, so I I sit I I sympathize with that, and I and I would and I would feel the same way if the type of behavior. Uh, was going around on around my house with fireworks and parties and and late night uh, things like that. Completely agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on. And everybody's uh, bursting to get to solutions here, so let's get to it. And uh, Victor, can you go to the next slide, please? So just uh, Victor did some. Victor and Jeff did some calling around about other communities in our area and what they do. And it's quite a smattering. Uh, Traverse City has, uh, they say they haven't restricted to some zoning districts, but my daughter rented a garage this spring, so it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, they say they must be licensed. Petoskey is struggling with it right now. 
they say only in their commercial zoning district, but uh, they got a bunch more residentials that are grandfathered in and they're evaluating hiring a company like ours. Uh, Mackinac City, they say they haven't allowed them in the residential districts um, in quite a number of years and it's good, but enforcement is difficult. And uh, next slide, please. Charlevoix, they say maximum 80, but they're a bunch likely operating unlicensed as well. Our city is uh, wrestling, is just starting right now. There's no regulations and a high amount of concern from residents. West Traverse Township and Little Traverse Township, neither has any uh, ordinance uh, at all about short-term rentals, but uh, there are many associations in those two townships and uh, those associations often have rules and regulations about that. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I put together kind of a, a range of <coughs> approaches that uh, cities and townships are using all around the country, kind of based on intensity, and uh, it ranges from no restrictions and no limits as the least intense type of uh, regulation. Uh, two would be all voluntary guidelines for owners and renters. And there'd be no need for enforcement for that. And I'd say we're kind of around three. We're kind of medium in terms of our intensity of enforcement and um, uh, our rules and regulations. Um, and then uh, we could uh, some cities are getting uh, much tighter, putting limits on the number of rentals allowed, where they're allowed, and uh, charging higher license fees and inspections. And some uh, uh, areas are trying to do complete bans. And I read about uh, uh, a movement in Nantucket um, where it's just tearing the community apart. And uh, there's a faction fighting for a complete ban and others who need the revenue desperately to continue to afford their houses on Nantucket. So it's extremely divisive, very, very complicated. Um, but um, enforcement is uh, the Achilles heel. When Victor and Jeff made their calls around every single uh, entity they talked to said, uh, yeah, we have these rules, but enforcement is a huge problem. We don't know how to do it or what to do it. Okay, Victor, next slide. So this is what enforcement could look like. Or it's a uh, officer with a badge, or it's a guy in a windbreaker that goes around. Um, <laughs> for real, I mean, if we say we want to enforce, okay, but this is what I wanted to talk through with you. It Barry, this is here we are enforcement. I wanted to get your thoughts on: Do we want a guy with a badge working from eight o'clock until midnight every night, driving to every rental? And the taxpayers pay for him, right? Anyways, could be many So Barry, what do you think? Should we, should we have this guy right here? <laughs> I think the 250 is a, a bargain. Yeah, and but we, we, have, money on we have this guy here doing this. I understand. I understand. Hear me out. All right. So at 250, we're losing money as a city to, to, to put up an issue that nobody wants or very few want. And so why don't, and if you, if you ask other cities and towns, that they, they charge uh, four times more than we do okay. to, to, hit, to pay for police right. and, and enforcement. And at 250, you can't do that. And so number one is get the, the money up there so you can enforce it. Okay. And that also discourages people from doing it. From, right. from, from uh, putting, you know, if they have to pay a thousand, Versus 250, so you might give thoughts to. No, I don't do that. Okay. But is this your vision of enforcement? How would it work exactly? Step one. That's, that's where I'm not sure. I, I have a thought. I, yeah. You have a program you said early on that identifies who's renting and who's not. Right. Okay, so can you do an analysis? Okay, they're renting. They've paid, they haven't mm -hmm. paid. So yes. then you go to the people that haven't paid, and there's got to be some kind of an impact on them if they're not following the rules and regulations. Yeah. And yes, maybe if they're paying a thousand dollars or somehow you limit them because they should not be disrupting that community sure. because they're not yes. under control. So court enforcement <laughs> could mean noise, it could mean smoke, bonfire smoke. Okay, so they have two impacts that things. they their license is taken away. Yep. And they're not allowed to. But who's, who's going to address 
the that, fireworks the at, in the back? Fireworks at midnight. Mm -hmm. The gentleman back is please. That's police would be going crazy no. this summer if everybody called yeah. on yeah. the man yeah. urinating. Give me a break. Yeah. I mean, this is so if you've currently got 51 paying licensees, yeah. that's about $22,000. If you name about the other 39 you think, we're at $45,000. That's got to be able to cover somebody. And I think the important hours are Thursday through Sunday night because people arrive either on Thursday through Sunday. And don't end at midnight. If the problems are at 2 a.m., okay. you keep somebody on call. Great. And I apologize earlier for suggesting that a homeowner go and find an agent number. I agree, you shouldn't have to be in that role, but we should be able to pay for code enforcement. And I think that looks just fine. Okay. And Thursday through Sunday from four in the afternoon, it doesn't have to be at eight in the morning. There's not that many problems there. Four in the afternoon till two. So, but hang on, you know, I want to clarify yeah. our fees are set up proportionate to the amount it costs to administrate and enforce a program. So, if we wanted to hire an enforcement officer, then yes, we could up the fees. But right now, we don't have another enforcement officer, we have an administrator. So, we can't legitimately charge over 250 unless we have a legitimate. Uh, purpose for charging that. Fee. So where's that eleven thousand dollars going? Eleven so thousand dollars goes to the primary the program that we use to monitor, and then we have the rest goes to our zoning administrator, city clerk, and police department to administrate and follow up on enforcement and deal with the issues. The cost of the why cost of enforcing it in the courts is going to way be way more. So I'm, ex I'm you can justify it on the basis of that. No, you can't. You can't justify it on the basis of the court for your fees or something. Why are there 80% unlicensed uh, short-term rentals in the city when you're paying for a service to tell you who they are and where they are? Thank you. Why, why yeah. isn't that being enforced? Well, I'm just going to ask the question. Well, that, Victor, when did the, uh, the city just contracted with that company? Last, late last year. So it's only, it has that, it's just, it's a new... It's and a new addition to the trying to enforce. We have about probably sixty-five percent license. We have about thirty-five percent. Well, if you have fifty-one license and forty yeah. unlicensed. Yeah. That's eighty percent. Potentially okay. thirty-nine unlicensed. Many of them have been calling us and have been stating that they no longer do it. The program has cut them for maybe twenty twenty or twenty nineteen. They just haven't been, for example, taken off here in the B system or the DOD okay. system. So we're it's probably we're probably at around seventy percent, sixty-five, seventy percent compliance. Maybe a little more. Yeah. We're working on that. That's, and this is the first year. So have regardless of funding, let me tell me more about, you know, is this what we want in the city of Harbor Springs? Yeah, we love our officers. We love our mailmen. We see the same people walking yeah. down our streets all the time. We would get to know these individuals. Okay. <laughs> so you're saying, yes, we do want them. I don't mind them. Okay. They're good guys like we've got now. Why not? These well, guys would I, make me feel safer. These guys would give me somebody to call if I was yeah, in trouble. Yeah. I, I want to touch on something real quick. So let me just briefly talk about the enforcement process. Um, we, anytime we get a complaint, one of the first things we do is verify the legitimacy of the complaint. Not to say that, you know, we doubt people or anything, but we have to be able to verify anything that's happening that we're going to be able to take action on. So one thing that is somewhat difficult for us, and I know I've had conversations with people that have con contacted me with complaints, is helping to provide some of that verification so that we can follow up on things. We don't always have the ability to rush right out to, to look at something right away. So um, in, in past practice, we've had a, some people in the audience here that when there has been a complaint, they've taken pictures and they've sent that to me, which really helps me in that verification process to be able to move on to the next step, which is once we've been able to verify that, contacting that local agent or the property owner in making the first steps to getting corrective action taken. Um, we do move to this step here that's on the screen when we get to the point where we feel that there's no other option. The question, I guess, really should be how quickly do we move from verification of a complaint to sending a police officer to that location to cite them with a the ticket, which means that we're taking them to court to ad address the issue. Right now, we do have a little bit of a process where I contact that property owner, the local agent, and I try and work with them so that we don't just show up first thing at somebody's door with a police officer. 
because that can be somewhat embarrassing, especially when it's an issue that let's say that that property owner didn't realize was a concern and they make quick amends to fix the situation. Um, right now, we've kind of got a, a three-part system. Uh, I, I try and work with them on the first two steps, and on that third step is when I hand things over to Kyle with the police department for that follow-up of reaching out to them and giving them a summons to go to court. Um, if, if you know, we have expedited this with moving from letters, which can take up to two weeks for somebody to receive, to phone calls through gathering the information from the the license applications that we have, which does help speed things up quite a bit. But I guess the bottom line question is, do we, it sounds like you guys would like us in, in the conversations that I've had and what I'm hearing tonight, a more expeditious path to sending a police officer to that person's door for, and contacting them. Yeah. We have a follow up to Jeff and then maybe Kyle, uh, Chief Kyle, if you could jump in. I'm all for that right, well, right now. If, if there's somebody disrupting the peace and harmony of the community, wouldn't a citation for you know a drunken disorderly or uh, violating violating the noise ordinance help when you you know that's the tenant the guest gets the ticket tonight and then when you do interact with the property owner have to take them to the courthouse now you've got some real verification we can move quickly on that I mean, is that how that could work uh, I was I'm was going to talk at the end, but I'll talk right now. I yield my bit. time to the chief. <laughs> <laughs> so, so any behavioral complaints, we will take care of. We will address. And I'm, I'm the guys are going to, they're not going to like me, but I work midnights as well. So if you have somebody that's lighting off fireworks or somebody that's causing a behavioral problem, call us. You guys, anybody in here who lives in the city pays our wages and we will respond. Um, the fireworks complaint was a prime example. I have a report right here where I think it was Officer Timmons went down and took the fireworks complaint the other night down on Glen Drive. We will address it at that time. We will take care of it. And we, I keep the reports. You know, we talk about short-term rentals and we had some up at the corner of the state and some we had issues earlier this year. I've kept every one of those reports. We have six reports today from that area. Um, we will respond. We'll document it. I've sent an email to the guys. If we have a short-term rental complaint, please do a report on it so that I have verification when we have meetings like this that we have them. I will say we don't have a lot of those complaints. And I know the guys, like I said, they might not like me, but if you have a drunk person in your neighbor, in your neighborhood, because the next house is a short-term rental, call us so that we can document it. If we don't know about it, we can address it. Um, there's a lot of people here com commenting about I have this in my neighborhood. I have this in my neighborhood. We haven't received those complaints. And I'm not asking to be bombarded, but in the same sense, everybody here pays my wage, pays our guys' wage, and I want to know about them. Now, Kyle, you can't address an occupancy, though, can you? Uh, no, I can't. I'm not I'm not going to go knock on the door and say how many people you have, and that's, that's a, I'm talking about behavioral complaints. Um, fire pits, fireworks, loud music, that type of thing. Please call us. I work midnights as well. We drive around all the time. Um, we're here to help you guys to maybe mitigate this problem. Sure. Why in the world should we be put in the position of having to call the police in the first place? Okay. You know, or have this. I mean, your you know, there somebody's making money, you know, three five hundred dollars a night, and we have to put up with, you know, they're they're not there. They're somewhere downstate or another state. I was trying to. I didn't know. Why do we have to call? Why do we have to be on guard to call the police? <laughs> I don't like this at all. I mean, this is crazy. This is a teeny little town. We're having enforcement officers for short-term rentals. Right. What? That's what we're exploring. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we shouldn't have that many to, to begin with. So you'd rather just ban. Ban. Okay. Ban above ban. the bluff. Ban. Allow below the bluff. The oh, police. So <laughs> We could set up licensing procedures for short term rentals, whereby, for instance, my understanding is there are no inspections of the homes that are renting now. So we don't know whether they need fire code. We don't yeah. know whether they need electrical yeah. plumbing mm -hmm. standards, if they've got egress issues in bedrooms. And I think about it, if, if I had got short-term rentals next door, but 
you know, I believe that house is up to code, but if Harper Springs has a fire in one of these homes and it catches fire on another person's house or God forbid somebody's killed in a house fire and we find that it's because no one ever bothered to inspect that house that was on a short-term rental or any long-term rental either, I think that that's a risk that Harper Springs should not take. Okay. And I think that you could set up licensing standards and stipulate what type of housing could be rented, what the condition of the house has to be. And to the point about having to call the police, it seems to me if we if we give real permits, not just, and I don't mean it that way, but right now, I think anyone can get that permit to return on 50 bucks. You don't have to do anything at all. In Michigan. Okay, the, no, right now, I think yeah. Yeah. I could get one if I wanted one tomorrow and not have to go through any of these steps. But it seems to me that if we issued permits, you could stipulate the inspection to make sure that the house is safe for anybody to live in. Um, you could also have very, very direct, um, very um, outlined regulations so that if somebody does have to call the police on that, that's on the owner of that property. They should they should have to pay a fine for that, as well as whatever ticket you would give to the short term renter that happens to be there. And so that if that happens two or three times, that license is pulled from that person. They just don't get another license for short term rental because you have to. To other people's points, you have to hold the owners responsible. Absolutely, it seems to me on this. And I also just question whether insurance companies are being notified that people are running short-term rentals out of their homes. And my guess is a lot of people are not notifying their insurance companies because there are different premiums attached to that. And also a lot of mortgage companies don't yeah. um, and look and your tax returns. It impacts yeah. your tax returns. But I mean, <laughs> all good points. But as a former middle school teacher, it all comes down to enforcement. If there's not somebody whose job it is to enforce it, and I know Jeff's got plenty of jobs and everybody else in the city hall already has. I like the idea of the enforcement um, officer. Um, that Then there's somebody responsible for it. So would you accept if we cannot regulate short-term rentals differently from any other residential property? Would you accept having Officer Dan here, whoever he is, um, driving around, you know, and enforcing codes at your house? We need two of them, Dan and Danielle. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Would that be okay? Oh, no, would I? Yes. Would be In okay. your own All right. Would he come around? If the law, if the oh, state the law, law says re requires that that a resident, in resident, full-time resident, has to have the same rules applied to them as to a renter. Would you want this guy knocking on your door and coming in and saying, well, you're not code here and this window isn't There's big enough for the fire there. escape. No. We don't like no. your plumbing. Oh, that's a we good don't point. Like no, your I, 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 I didn't think that This is a question of interpretation. What, what, how we treat owners versus how we treat short-term rental. If you go from an owner-occupied house to a short-term rental, that's a change of use. If you have a change of use for an owner-occupied house, then you will have an inspection. Yes. So that's not treating them different. It's tr it's it's the way it should be done. Well, and and to, that point, have a legislature. And to that point, to that point, there are communities throughout Michigan, as being a real estate broker, I've encountered it, where when a house changes hands, ownership interest, it gets a C of O. Similarly, when the house becomes and so that that requires inspection every, every and everything. Right. Okay, everybody, regardless of your extended use. That's your point. If you say, you know what, we're going to move here and make this a rental. Now then there's a rental inspection before they get their rental license. And if by chance that tenant is gone before the term of the rent is, is a, of the lease is expired, guess what? Another inspection. So I think if it's good for one, it's good for all. That would be interesting. That's interesting. Painful, but it would be good. Uh, sir. Um, we just built a new home and the inspectors were invariably super courteous and they helped us in the building process. They actually made things better because when they found things, we were able to address things with the contractor or whoever was working. Yep. So I think the idea of code enforcement does everything to improve the housing stock and nothing to 
to harm them. All right, can I just, this is you know, a key issue on enforcement and it's a possible change in our you know, thought and our, at least it is in my thinking. Can I get a show of hands of people who would be okay with Officer Daniel, <laughs> Officer Daniel and his partner uh, patrolling the city looking for code violations? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. The Hoffmans on the Hill also had a wedding last weekend also and shot off fabulous fireworks. Did they come to the city and get an okay for a permit for their festivities for the wedding? That's not the city. party on the block. I had to get the city to approve, and they were nice enough to shut the street in. Everybody wanted to see how I built the house. It was a street yeah. Okay, can I get a show of hands for people who would favor some, you know, coat? Uh, some, some, some. You have to ask it two different ways. If the legislation passes, and if, if it doesn't, how about your perspective? Why don't we have a court enforcement for people with dog waste in the yard? Yeah. Or fire weapons? Yeah. 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 Could, could you indulge me on that last question? Yeah. You know, who would like to see strong, dedicated code enforcement in the city? For you know, probably for residents and everybody else. I'd like to make a comment. Yes. Okay, now. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment. I, yeah, think, please do. I don't think there's anything wrong with code enforcement. I think it can be some good. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of residents in the city who their permanent residents don't meet fire code, egress code. There's a lot of homes, and if you come knocking on their door and telling them they need to make $20,000 for the rooms in their house, they're not going to be able to afford to do it. But they're risking themselves, they're not risking a stranger who's coming from... But you're talking about people who can't afford to make those improvements. No, I'm not talking about rentals. I'm talking about permanent residents. But they're only risking themselves. Those, those residents are only risking themselves. Where's he saying? He's saying you have to enforce the enforcement. Couldn't it be specified rental code enforcement? Code is code. Code is what's written in the city. We could, we could, we could, we could try many things. Right? Before we jump to this, yeah. I was curious have we done an analysis of problems that originated from like a uh, a short-term rental that has all everything that's working because I, I bought one for the purpose of this last year we have a manager i'm around we've had zero problems whatsoever versus someone that's not here that's it's like an animal house right and they're, they're unlicensed have we have we seen the the number of problems in relation to those two buckets no i think it's more anecdotal anecdotal at this point okay. and where it's we blame it on an out of town owner or an absentee owner who doesn't have good strong local manager. and the question would be could you enforce not having the regulation like you get a five thousand dollar fine for operating on brbo or airbnb versus that and then you enforce people to do it the right way i don't know I don't know. another thought is taking a big deposit from somebody as part of the licensing process and then uh Keeping control of that. Yes, ma'am. Can you have plain close enforcement? Whoever said they don't want to live in a community where you know you have Big Brother walking around all the time? I think you, if you're going to have rules and regulations, somehow they have to be enforced, and so you have yeah. to have either a part-time employee or you, you have to have an enforcement. But does it have to be that kind of enforcement? Is there another way of doing it? And is there a way, you know, with fines, with, I just kind of feel like there's a middle ground someplace okay. in here, not jumping from zero to 100. I, I have one more question. Yes, ma'am. Do we, I mean, listening to Kyle, do we know really what percentage of rentals are causing issues versus those that are causing issues? You may have the 80-20 rule where 80% of them are good, 20% are not. And we're trying to use a, a broad brush over everybody when it's only 20%. But see, I mean, what happened is like she had the fireworks in the- Yeah, but did she do anything? Did she, she call? We don't well, know if she did anything. It worked and she called. And I think if everybody who no, had experience has actually called Chief Knight, he'd have a really long list. Well, really long. Yeah, well you're, you're, you're be absolutely right. I've never <laughs> called. I've never called well, my, uh, my family and my home that in danger weekly. Well, why haven't years. you called? Yeah, One reason I'm afraid of the neighbors. I'm afraid of the retaliation because I've seen how they behave. I'm afraid of their guests. I've seen how they behave again. I'm afraid of the retaliation. 
One, I kind of don't want to haul an officer over there when it is somebody who's kind of like peeping in my windows and being obnoxious or drunk or whatever. But then when they endanger the neighborhood with open fires, abandoned fires, then I'm really kind of, I don't know well, what to do. If I could speak to that on a personal basis, sure. I've had, I had an issue with somebody had an AK-47 and I went to the door and knocked on it and said, that's not going to happen. You've got to be out of here in an hour. And they did, but I did have a police officer behind me. So I can understand your concern, but we also have to stand up for our own rights. Yeah. And if we don't, um, then there's a lot of room for confusion. But I think there's a, a difference of between professional on, management. On the and but I was the agent. I know. Yeah. You were the agent. But what we're just hearing agents. are that agents might be the guy that mows the lawn. And that's a sad situation. Well, then, there's worse than that. Too. It doesn't matter if there's a disruption of the public safety and health right. and yeah. harmony. Yeah. That's a call to law enforcement. Correct. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And there's already yeah. rules against that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Ma'am. I just had a little bit of a question, and maybe it's a smidge offside. Um, this has been really informational for me. I'm hearing how many people, right, non residents, are able to. You know, very successfully um, hearing a lot of these stories, right? Do short term rentals. Something I'm wondering with a lot of the information that was shared is do we or other communities look at the rules or potential guidelines for principal residents versus non principal? Because what I'm hearing in this room a lot is something that I'm very close to. Um, my family had property up here growing up. We had regular families every year renting our house. I mean, we knew them, right? So the neighbors all knew them. Um, so I don't have any issue with that, but it just seems like a lot of what I'm hearing, what do we do about if I am a primary resident, what are the rules that are different? I'm hearing like 37%, right, are primary residents. Um, not that there should be different rules, but I'm just hearing a lot of different things, and I hope I'm making some sense of it. Again, I'm not opposed to much of what I'm hearing. It scares me about the enforcement. I think we should all be very responsible adults and look after one another in the community. But, you know, maybe that's not where we are. So my real point was we talk about principal residents versus non-principal and folks not being here. I don't see that in my direct neighborhood. You know, so I, just a lot of different information. Are you sign? No, I am not. It's not my principal residence, and I've never read that my house for one night. So you want me? Just because I wouldn't. It's I'm not comfortable. We're just talking about the fact that we can't enjoy our front porch because of the commotion. In the okay. summer, we can't sit out because it's a foggy now. Okay, one more comment, please, and we've got to wrap this thing up um, pretty soon. I am a host who rent out our house. We've never had any issues. We always rented out to families. All my neighbors have my cell phone. I do have a local agent. I get to know these people. They tell me the grandma's coming, you know, the grandkids are coming. Um, and we come up, you know, we don't rent it out a lot. We rent it out a little bit. And so a, a lot of, I think, is just this good neighbor. We also have on one side of our house, um, our property is a long-term rental. And just because they're long-term rental doesn't mean they're a good neighbor. No. Wild fire, pit. fire pit in the backyard, and I know they hate that. So it's, I feel like some of this is just picking and choosing if you don't like something, if they're a short-term rental, where I think we just need to be good neighbors. Yes, we sure do. Victor, let's move good. on. And Thank you. That was very good input on that. I really appreciate that. And... Um, so what I think we could do just in the last five minutes, do you have any ideas of things we could do, assuming that the new law is going to pass and it's going to become law? What could we do? What actions could we take right now that wouldn't be, you know, wasted time, wasted effort that, would, that could make things better for next year? These short-term rentals are basically hotels. So why don't we put them to the same standards that a hotel was? A hotel has to be inspected regularly for fire, for health, mm -hmm. uh, lead paint, and all of that. Yep. Why don't we give those restrictions to these people? Yep. They are a business. They're making a lot of money, and they're not being responsible. The one next to us, they live downstate. 
and they have no control over it. And there's parties all the time. So uh, I'm sure the house wouldn't make it as a hotel. Yeah. Now yeah. That, so the new legislation slams that door pretty effectively. It says it is not a commercial use of the property. It's a, it's a by right residential use of the property. So I'm afraid they're taking, you know, they've targeted that argument very specifically to nullify it. But when, when is a residence not a residence, but a business? Under this, uh, under this new bill, it's always a residence. It's but a it's by still right residential a change use. of use. It's going from a private residence yep. to a place for rent. So that's a change of use. Any place else, a change of use requires neighborhood participation and um, a say in it and inspection. So why can't we do that? Well, I, that, you know, what I wanted to explore with you, if you would help me, is if this bill does pass and they close all these doors for us to regulate you know, differently than full-time residents, then what is there anything that we could do that we could be working on right now to make things better? We could be doing these things right now and not worry about that. That bill okay. was supposed to have been done in June. It was yep. supposed to have been okay. done in July. It was supposed to have been done in August. Now it's going to be done in September. They're just kicking it down the road. Great. So why wait for them to decide? Let's do something now okay. and, and get going on it. So I hear you. So one course of action. If they don't do it, we're all set. Great. Okay. So what you're recommending is proceed. Go ahead. Let's tailor some regulations in a way that we think would be effective for our community and damn the torpedoes. If, yes. it, if the bill passes, then we'll reassess. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, homeowner or rentals or homes or whatever you want to call us, we're rental properties. are always looking for ways to draw in more renters. What if we volunteered to abide by all these regulations? No campfires, car limits, yeah. all that. And the city lists us on their website as authorized or come up with some word that we've Preferred. been inspected. Yeah. We're safe. Okay. We abide by it. We're good neighbors. Best practice. And we but and we go on the website and and the city advertises. We have a list of conscientious homeowners. Okay. Great. And you can do that in a month. I support I support that idea. I think it's a I think that's a good idea. And uh and I in fact on our listing already have uh I'm I say we are proudly licensed by the city of Harbor Springs. Okay, cool. Okay, sir. I think one issue with that is as a as a host, you might come across well, hey, you know, one family out of several that does make noise and, and, and breaks the rules. I know it costs money, so I'm not against the $250 licensing fee. Um, but I think incremental more uh enforcement of existing noise and nuisance rules. Okay. I mean, everybody is subject to the noise and nuisance yes. rules. Yes. Nobody yes. should have to live with them. Right. Um, and it, if it takes incremental enforcement for the rentals, then the, the licensing should pay a fee to cover that incremental enforcement. But I think that solves your issue because you're making a rule. Everybody has to follow noise and nuisance regulations. Throughout the state. So no wasted effort there. Should be good and, and, and it's having, um, an association of the property owners or the mm -hmm. renters or the whoever's on the signage for the $250 oh, license. Okay. Maybe you yeah. have a quarterly meeting with them and they can get together and discuss. I mean, it would help them. And then if anybody had complaints in the area, they could come to that meeting and okay. place them right to Thank the you. source. Sir, I think one important part is enforcement. And in getting revenue for enforcement, you may want to have a sliding scale on the portion of how much they're renting the place for. You wouldn't want to have a high fee on someone who's charging you know, $150 a night versus someone who's charging $1,600 a night. I think there could be incrementally increased revenue to aid the city in its efforts to enforce things um, by making a sliding scale. Yeah, but the argument can also be when you are renting it out for say 1100 a night, you're attracting a different clientele that likely won't be a problem and or the- Oh, I got it, I'm finally finished. And then the, the, the host would then have enough revenue to keep the property up better. 
No. So, I mean, no, I don't no, 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 no. I get your point. Tax. No. Okay. Tax. I think Any other I short term think. ideas that we can take? Kyle. I just want to, once again, number one, apologize for using the word hate earlier because I, my guys, we like to work and we like to keep busy. <laughs> and so if you have an issue with your neighbor, whether he's a short term rental or he's your neighbor and he has a fire at two in the morning, call us. Please do. And, uh, uh, and when we talk about property managers, if you look at probably the place that has the most people in it, and we had, we've had this many complaints, is the people who work at the Little Harbor Club. That place has probably 25 people in there, and we've had no complaints because Jed Avery does a great job of being a property manager of all those kids. He, uh, if they have an issue, he addresses it, and we have had no complaints. There's 20, probably 20, 25 people, I should say that, living in that place, and because he runs a good house, Nobody calls. And so but I want to end with thank you for hosting this because I yeah. think it's an important thing and you've done a great job. Yeah. And this morning I was at a face mask at the school board meeting and that wasn't an easy thing neither for the host. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, and please use us. If you have a problem with your neighbor, please call us. And I'll send an email out tonight to the guys that they can expect some more calls. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give comfort to a couple of the people here? Because I think we all wrestle with this. And I dealt with an issue with a cross the street um, neighbor recently, rather than calling you, because I kind of know them. And I thought, I'm going to walk across. They were kids. I don't think they were underage drinking. It was 1230 at night. They were playing loud music and their conversations were caring. That's what happens when you're near the water. And so I thought, forget it. I'm just going to go say something. I'm going to be nice about it. I'm, not, I'm going to tell them I'm not calling the police. I'm telling them I'm not telling their parents because I want them to take care of the problem themselves and we'll all get along fine. Very polite, nice young man. The noise stopped immediately. Didn't happen again. Haven't had to say another thing. Now, I don't disagree that it can be a scary thing. So what do you do to protect the person who's calling? You can call and you can remain anonymous, number one. Okay. And everybody lives, you know, that's here lives within, and they all have multiple neighbors. So I will send in my email as well that if somebody calls anonymous, they have to remain anonymous. Yeah. And we, so you can call mm -hmm. anonymous. And your point's well taken as far as, because I've heard that multiple times where if you just, because most of the people who run up here like our town. And if you go in the, and they pay good money to stay here. And so they're mostly, they're respectable. So if you go say, Hey, you know, I got an issue with your music at two in the morning, they're going to respect that. And they're, they're not going to want us to come. Right. And you say the next call that you could just threaten them, say the next call is going to be the, the police. police. Yeah. So, and Kyle, should we dial 911? Yes. You call 911. Don't do not like call but... at two, at two in the morning or anytime after four in the afternoon, don't call our office because it goes to voicemail. We all check our voicemail frequently, but it could sit there for two or three hours before we check it. So just call 911. You're not going to burn central dispatch. That's why they're there. Good point. <laughs> okay. We're going to wrap this up. One last comment. Well, I just want to say as a host, and I know people said they, they don't want to have the burden of it, but just so that you know people do know as neighbors as a host we want to know if somebody's right. being disruptive destructive or disruptive like anything so it's it's like offensive to me if my neighbors don't say anything it's like what like why would you not have told me that you know and honestly i don't think any of my guests have ever been but if they were I'm more disruptive than my guests. <laughs> so, but I, it's like, you know, we want to know. So it's not like we are going to be mad or, you know, we're going to be grateful and that, then be in a partnership with, with our neighbors. So, you know, I think that that's important. That's great. Well. Thank you very much. Well, the next question is, what do we do next? And uh, so we're going to summarize all this, take it back to the planning commission. And uh, first of all, consider it in the master plan what we want to say about short term rentals. And uh, then, you know, the planning commission could have some more discussion about it. Maybe they want to advance the issue a bit. They can put together a specific proposal that gets some public, uh, gets more public input on that, have a public hearing. And then they could advance something to the city council. Really, you know, planning commission can think things through and really sort things out and uh, maybe teed up in a good way for the city council. So um, if you would, you know, reflect on this, sleep on it, uh, think about it a bit more. And if you have, 
you know, a specific succinct proposal, you know, you could get it to Victor and he can, he can get it to us. And I just want to tell you, I mean, we, I'm a planning commissioner thinking about this all day, every day. It's, you know, a burning issue in our community. We get it. We're, um, we get the arguments on both sides and, uh, you know, we have a great place to live and we don't want this to tear the community apart. So um, we're going to try to come up with, you know, the right thing to do. So if you have a succinct, you know, specific proposal, get it to Victor. He gets enough complaints, but he's looking for solutions and we all are. So um, you had a specific solution. Let's get it in right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's 